Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode, this evening's episode. The title is, Could Empathy Be Emotional Teleportation? I would like to begin by saying that we as a species have not, uh, we don't have teleportation technology, but we have the pioneer, we have pioneered the beginning of teleportation technology. And it came first from the phone, where sound could pretty much teleport from one person's inner realm to another, you know? Then we went to images and video. We can teleport two of the senses out of the five sensory perception we can't teleport smells yet. We can't, we can't teleport teleport um, sensation, feeling like touching something, you know. And smell. These three of the senses, we can't teleport yet. <clears throat> and of course, the physical being, I would say. So, we can teleport sound and video image. <clears throat> we cannot teleport the human being. Now, I feel whenever there is empathy, a phenomenon where somebody receives another person's emotion somehow, See, guys, when I looked at the definition of empathy as the dictionary, it knows it to be the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. Now, one can say, <clears throat> let's say a person becomes emotional, we're an energetic being, therefore if somebody becomes emotional in, an, in a room, there is some sort of energetic change of them, of the, of them in the room. Um,
I think that's pretty much feng shui. <laughs> it's pretty much about that. But I'm trying to say like a person can be, <clears throat> imagine somebody gets angry in a room and then somebody else irrelevant to that situation comes into that room and feels angry or feels intense or feels something off with the room. You can say it's not a more emotional teleportation, but it's empathy of some sort. It's empathy with a delay. We can say <clears throat> if an event happens and a bunch of people become emotional, technically all those people by the nature of perceiving that incident are emotionally teleported. You know, there's certain things like I remember <clears throat> seeing a very emotional movie scene and I thought I wasn't going to tear up or something. But then something from that scene happened unexpected and I, I had gotten emotional, you know. It's as if there is something real. There's something real about one human being, one inner realm, going through something that the outer realm instantly notices. I would say... Um, I don't know, for example, for siblings, I would say, like I have a twin brother, there, there was a day specifically, something had happened where I had come home and I was really quiet. And just by a couple seconds of seeing me, my brother knew there was something off, right? It was a sort of like he could resonate with the emotion. He could notice the difference in emotion. <clears throat> and let's say a comedian tells a joke, everybody's emotionally teleported in that moment. There is a mystery to human intelligence, which every day I'm trying to kind of figure out in regards to <clears throat> what Carl Jung spoke about as synchronicity and coinc uh, coincidences. Where it's as if like, I, sometimes I feel it's like there is an event taking place a sort of invisible event and when human beings uh, are resonate with that event they it's like an antenna range and if they don't resonate with that event it's as if there is no antenna range
you know guys in Buddhism there is this view that an emotion <clears throat> is a thought that has lingered too long that has become unpleasant So what that could mean is that all emotions have a simultaneous translation as thought. And what that means is if a person feels something, they are perhaps, feel, I mean, think about it. It's like a person can feel happiness, but it's not that if, if in twice they feel happiness, it's the same happiness, you know? I have felt sadness, I have felt pain, but never it has been the same sadness like two days in a row, do you know what I mean? Or the same sort of stress two days in a row. It has been a different kind of stress, a stress for each day. Now that difference, if we consider it on an emotional level, what does that mean? <clears throat> that means, let's say, um, a person, let's say a person A and person B are in the park, sitting on a park bench. Person A suddenly remembers, <clears throat> I don't know, something sad. Let's say remembers their parrot dying, you know. There is a very random chance that the person beside that person who's instantly remembering, especially through an emotion, might be like, hey man, have you heard this joke about parrots out of nowhere, you know. And so what I, what, what I think this, is, this synchronistic, this union synch synchronicity is, is the implication of an overmind. Now this overmind to the individual is not that conceivable. What that means is if we were all one being, we would technically be able to experience all emotions at once. Now, we don't experience all emotions at once in this conscious framework, but let us say that we experience some emotions. There's this concept called remote viewing. Not a lot of people know it, it has been pushed to the corners of the new age. But I would tell you the idea was pretty much the person is resonating with another moment in this existence. What does that mean? That means you could be like, I don't know, <clears throat> looking at the sky or climbing a tree in a certain way and instantly in that moment feel as if somebody else somewhere else is doing the same thing you know it's like a resonance or an example of it would be like a person who sees an actual real event but they don't see it at the location of the event There's this story uh, my grandmother told me a long time ago. And uh, the story does have a sort of super natural uh, context, you know, context to it, but it's like pretty much there's this um, <clears throat> woman, this old lady, who her son is going on a trip. Her son is going on a trip, and this woman dreams that her the plane is going to crash, something like that. And <clears throat> she doesn't wake up her son, who had to go to the flight early in the morning. Pretty much she doesn't wake up her son, The she, they ter she turns on the news, the plane crashed, she goes to wake up, I don't know, I don't know if the, the plane crashed, like, 
The whole thing is she realizes her son had died. That means she didn't wake up the son who had to go on the airplane <clears throat> and the son had died, you know, something like that. And there was something there where it was as if she, in her, like just as an example, she had in her dream seen an event. Maybe not an event taking place instantly, but an event taking place, maybe, <clears throat> you know. What I'm trying to say was that it's as if, if we are an antenna, and if this antenna is divided between the conscious mind and the unconscious, it's as if sometimes it could be that the conscious mind receives a signal and instead of being able to comprehend the signal, notices the unconscious. You know, by the nature of even identifying with the form, we allow ourselves to extract emotion. That means if the person, <clears throat> imagine we, they try this experiment and there's this young child and this young child, its first friends were robots. Literally, it, it played with robots as a kid, let's say till the age of 12. Now, this kid suddenly, in front of this kid, one day, all these robot friends this kid has had, no human friends, just robot friends, one day they start destroying the robot friends. Now, that kid may know that those are robots, but because the kid has identified they are my friends, the moment you destroy the robot, the kid starts crying, right? So you see the emotion becomes seems to become accessible the moment we accept the identity. Guys, the, the reason I shared that uh, story, I just saw the chat section, the reason I shared that story of the son not wait, not waking up and as if passing away, where it was as if, not because that as if like we're natural beings and there's designated moments where we require to be, you know, <clears throat> but I would say it's not, <clears throat> it's not per se a sort of destiny or a karmic seed kind of thing, but I would say the whole the reason I shared that story was to say that that woman got access to a, another moment. That means from one local space, whether it's in the dream state or whether it's in the conscious waking state, you know, there can be access to other. But I would say emotions don't necessarily have to do with identity either. I have been in nature and I've got an emotional and it, it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was like crying, but it was, <laughs> but it was like tears of <clears throat> gratefulness. I've had various moments where I've just looked at life simply and I've been like, oh my God, it's all here. And there's, there's this strange sort of, <clears throat> you know, acceptance of the simplicity of the moment. That means <clears throat> the emotion is some sort of shift. Something is changing. Now, I think what a person gets emotional when they get surprised if the outer realms isn't in sync with the inner realms or the inner realms aren't in sync with the outer realms. And I can give you perfect examples of these. When the inner realms are not synced with the outer realms, it's an example of the person thinking life is just such a, such a gentle, loving place. 
<laughs> it's like the person thinking this place, this world is a paradise. You know, their inner realms think this world is a paradise. Their outer realms, um, they are oblivious pretty much to their outer realms. This person would suddenly notice the real nature of the outer realms so different than their inner realms, and they will get emotional and see. And other way around is that the person thinks they're just this object in the middle of nowhere and suddenly realize, wait a minute, where were all my thoughts happening? Where was the wonder of the attention moving when the eyes are closed happening? An exam another more down-to-earth example uh, um, would be if the person's, let's say, doing one thing in the outer realms and suddenly realizes they could have done so many other things. There has also been moments where I would say emotions have happened without reason. I mean, aside from nature, nature at least there's a sort of serenity and energetic peacefulness. But um, <clears throat> I don't know, outside of nature, there has been moments where I have felt like, I don't know, just suddenly upset without reason. As if like my unconscious mind, something tragic maybe is happening in the unconscious uh, sphere of the person's attention and their consciousness doesn't know directly but indirectly knows. I have learned that in the outer realms, emotions they are important. It's important to be honest and to have enough vulnerability to be a human being, you know, on this planet. But I would say <clears throat> emotion, when it comes to speed, it reduces it. So the more emotional the person is, <clears throat> the slower they are, you can say. Because the emotion can change the rhythm of the movement that it's it's an example of somebody speaking monotone and then somebody speaking with like elevations in their voice and suddenly you know you know what i mean like You know, guys, I'm going to go into a, a quote tunnel of the word emotion. A quote tunnel is a segment of this show, of these episodes, where pretty much I look into a theme or a person in history, how their inner realms, how the inner realms was open to the idea or how the person opened their inner realms to the idea. T.S. Eliot, poetry is not a turning loose of emotion, but an escape from emotion. It is not the expression of personality, but an escape from personality. But, of course, only those who have personality and emotions know what it means to want to escape from these things. <laughs> Thank you.
I would say the same way T.S. Eliot is saying poetry, it's an escape from personality. I would say, in my view, poetry is like trying to break a door <clears throat> or trying to, uh, yeah, pretty much, I would say it's breaking a door. It is trying to tap into the unknown. It is trying to uh, realize uh, the abstract. Matthew Rickard says negative emotions like hatred destroy our peace of mind. <clears throat> Pablo Picasso says colors like features follow the changes of emotions. Oscar Wilde says the advantage the advantage of emotions is that they lead us astray. Oscar Wilde also says there's always something ridiculous about the emotions of people who one has ceased to love. T.S. Eliot says, any poet, if he is to survive beyond his 25th year, must alter. He must seek new literary influences. He will have different emotions to express. Wayne Dyer says, strong emotions such as passion and bliss are indications that you're connected to spirit or inspired. If you will, when you are inspired, you active, activate dormant forces and the abundance you seek in any form comes steaming into your life. Guys, I think Wayne Dyer is saying I'm going to get an advanced civilization for Christmas. <laughs> The Dalai Lama says my faith helps me overcome such negative emotions and find my equilibrium. <clears throat> Marilyn Monroe, a man is more frank and sincere with his emotions than a woman. We girls, I'm afraid, have a tendency to hide our feelings. Bertrand Russell, the degree of one's emotions varies inversely with one's knowledge of the facts. Jim Ron, take advantage of every opportunity to practice your communication skills so that when important occasions arise, you will have the gift, the style, the shots. Oh my God. Take advantage of every opportunity to practice your communication skills. Oh my God. What did I just read? <clears throat> um, <laughs> guys, let me tell you, the only communication skill to practice is sincerity, simplicity. That's it. If the person can get comfortable with the, mo with the most simplest states, of being, whether it's minimalistic, whether it's detached, wh 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 whatever, however way you paint it, <clears throat> then there comes a comfort with the complex. When I look at my own life, it's as if I had to overcome the simple. That means, believe it or not, the simple used to be complex. Now it's simple. You know. <laughs> Ed
Eckhart Tolle says, I sometimes ask people, can you be aware of your own presence? Not the thoughts that you're having, not the emotions that you're having, but the very presence of your very being. You become aware of your own presence by sensing the entire energy field in your body that is alive. All that is the totality of your presence. Neil deGrasse Tyson says, rational thoughts never drive people's creativity the way emotions do. Sigmund Freud says, flowers are restful to look at. They have neither emotions nor conflicts. Imagine all the flowers are like shouting at that moment, liar, liar. <laughs> Eckhart Tolle says, In the egoic state, your sense of self, your identity is derived from your thinking mind. In other words, what your mind tells you about yourself, the storyline of you, the memories, the expectations, all the thoughts that go through your head continuously and the emotions that reflect those thoughts, all those things make up your sense of self. And space, guys. You need space before you could be yourself. You literally need to have space in your mind we could, before you, <laughs> you can move in as a self. <laughs> Rainer Maria Rilke. All emotions are pure, which gather you and lift you up. The emotion is impure, which seizes only one side of your being and so distorts you. So far, guys, I don't really feel these quotes are emotional. <laughs> Brian Tracy says, just as your car runs more smoothly and requires less energy to go faster and further, farther, when the wheels are in perfect alignment, you perform better when your thoughts, feelings, emotions, goals, and values are in balance. Jim Valvano, I just got one last thing. I urge all of you, all of you, to enjoy your life, the precious moments you have to spend each day with some laughter and some thought to get uh, your emotions going. Johnny Cash says of emotions, of love, of breakup, of love and hate and death and dying, mama, apple pie and the whole thing. It covers a lot of territory country music does. Johnny Cash is literally speaking like Yoda. <laughs> Virginia Woolf, I can only note that the past is beautiful because one never realizes an emotion at the time. It expands later and thus we don't have complete emotions about the present, only about the past. Tony Robbins, Take control of your consistent emotions and begin to consciously and deliberately reshape your daily experience of life. Joyce Mayer says, we all have two lives, an inner life and an outer life. There we go. Your inner life is your soul life, which includes your mind, will, and emotions. 
Your outer life is your physical life. And while God cares about every detail of your life, he's more concerned with your inner life than your outer life. <clears throat> so guys, there's a difference. I, I perceive the outer life to be physical, but I consider the inner life to be the mind. I don't consider the soul to be like when you when I say you go truly within, there is no within and without. That's the attributeless witness. So when life is no longer like a coin flipping in the air, reality has uh, found its uh, nature. Guys, W. Clement Stone says an incredible quote here. Uh, when we direct our thoughts properly, we can control our emotions. So again, a another correlation similar to Buddhism of thought <clears throat> with thought. So what does it mean to control our thoughts properly? I would say first thing it would mean to not be a thought because you can't control it if you can't see it. You know, and because the eyes can't see their self, literally, like when you look in the mirror, you can't see the one looking, you can see what's there, but you can't see the one looking. That means you can see your body in the mirror, you can't see your mind. So to control to direct our thoughts properly, I would say to be content with the witness, then be able from that non-dual state to do the work of the cosmic activity. That means technically everybody from the beginning of time, uh, ever since the concept of an occupation was there, has been working for the cosmos, everybody. Because every being is from the cosmos. Every being is part of the cosmic activity. So we are working in the cosmos. And I feel uh, perhaps in the future we will work as the cosmos. Our consciousness will be inseparable. The land will become our body. Nikola Tesla says, I do not think there is any thrill that can go through the human heart like that felt by the inventor as he sees some creation of the brain unfolding to success. Such emotions make a man forget food, sleep, friends, love, everything. Yeah, the future is one thing that uh, <clears throat> can make you forget everything there is in the present. Guys, this quote I shared from Nikola Tesla right now, I just shared it in the chat section. I would tell you this quote, I could totally relate in the sense that when he says some creation, um, <clears throat> he says, <clears throat> I do not think that there's any thrill that can go through the human heart like that felt by the inventor as he sees some creation of the brain unfolding to success. Such emotions make a man for and let me tell you why it makes a man forget food, sleep, friends, love, everything. Because the new is like a string where it's not that you just pull it and it ends. The string is done. It's like a short string. It's an endless string. Novelty is an endless string being pulled. And I would say that's the thing, the unfolding of the success. I've had moments where I have gone to bed, uh, like this is how I've mastered writing in darkness. Like I can, I can like 
be anywhere in a pitch black dark room and write on a piece of paper, you know? And the way I, 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 it was, it was one of those things that <clears throat> the way I kind of mastered it was <laughs> so indirect. I would, some nights I would go to sleep and right when I would put my head on the pillow and just take that breath of relaxation to settle into the moment. I remember I would have so many ideas come to me. That means uh, you might not, people might not know this, but I have tons of like, like maybe like three notebooks filled with title names for different talks I've thought of giving in the future. Now, those title names, they would come to me as right before I sleep. It was as if when the person is about to sleep, they don't care. So they suddenly see everything beyond a specific way. And so I would, I would get into bed, you know, all the lights are off. Right when I would sleep, an incredible idea would come. I would have to get up, turn on the light, go write it in a notebook. Then I would sleep and this would happen. This happened like maybe like three, four times on this before I, would, I could sleep properly. To a point where I started sleeping with a notebook and a pen. And I would advise this, like, <clears throat> you know, like if you're going to sleep with a notebook and a pen beside you, put the pen inside the cylindrical corner of the notebook. <clears throat> but anyways, uh, cylindrical bar of the notebook. Anyways, um, so, so what would happen is that I would just turn off the lights, be there, and it, how you write in the darkness is just pure by feeling. Because the moment the pen makes contact with the piece of paper, just by feeling how the pen moves as you move it, Pretty much by feeling the movement of the pen, you can just see the piece of paper in your mind and write on it. So it is the case that when the person doesn't want anything or accepts the moment, suddenly everything is seen. That means imagine a person is do, making a mistake and they're suffering, suffering, suffering and endless people are like, don't make this mistake, don't make this mistake. And the moment the person accepts that, okay, maybe I'm making a mistake, right there, there has come an ability for a new mode of thought. That means if the person can't accept the moment, they can't move beyond it. And it could be also, <clears throat> I mean, to bring this back to empathy and emotions, it could be that we actually don't have emotions and the emotions are like signals. That means it's like, you know how there's solar flares? that we perceive to hit the earth, imagine there is, you know, in, in a realm, just like we can't see Wi-Fi waves, there is flare, there are waves hitting the planet, and these are causing emotions. I mean, the human being's emotions, if your eyes are open, the outer realms <clears throat> are dictating it. If your eyes are closed, it's, it, it, it's left to the inner realms, really.
I would say David Hume says there is a very remarkable inclination in human nature to bestow on external objects the same emotions which it observes in itself and to find everywhere those ideas which are most present to it. Yeah, David Hume what he's saying is that uh, the outer realms reflect the inner realms. That means when a person animates in their conscious view the other person's character, like right now, people who are listening to my talk, they don't know, like you, people don't know who I am, you know, they know certain fragments of my life. But um, for the person to assume, how would I say this? Uh, pretty much everybody is seeing everybody else through their uh, uh, tunnel of experiences so far in this life. Jocko Willink, Willink, Jocko Willink, Willink, says one of the key qualities a leader must possess is the ability to detach, to detach from the chaos, mayhem, and emotions in a situation and make good, clear decisions based on what is actually happening. Karim Abdul Jab Jabbar says you have to be able to center yourself to let all of your emotions go. Don't ever forget that you play with your soul as well as your body. Alan de Bolton de Botton. The button, what with the no, says the romantic person instinctively sees marriage in terms of emotions, but what a couple actually gets gets up to together over a lifetime has much more in common with workings of a small business. They must draw up work rosters, clean, chauffeur, cook, fix, throw away, mind, hire, fire, reconcile, and budget. Alex Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Sol 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 Solzhenitsyn. Yeah, I guess I have no idea how to pronounce. It. <laughs> Alexander S says it is not because the truth is too difficult to see that we make mistakes. We make mistakes because the easiest and most comfortable course for us is to seek insight where it accords with our emotions, especially selfish ones. Ramana Marshi, who am I? Not the body, because it is decaying. Not the mind, because the brain will decay with the body. Not the personality, nor the emotions, for these will also vanish with death. Elizabeth Taylor says, I have a woman's body and a child's emotions.
Vasily Kandinsky says every work of art is the child of its age and, in many cases, the mother of our emotions. It follows that each period of culture produces an art of its own which can never be repeated. Great point there. Kevin Hart says some people love so hard that they can't control those emotions when they're at their deepest point. That's an interesting way of saying it. It's like I'm loving so hard right now. <laughs> I'm loving the oneness of truth so hard right now. <laughs> You know, that's, uh, that's, that's maybe like something you can write on a t-shirt, love hard. Giordano Bruno Beautiful sights arouse feelings of love and contrary sights bring feelings of disgrace and hate and the emotions of the soul and sp spirit bring something additional to the body itself which exists under the control of the soul and the direction of the spirit. Yeah, the unknown mover that's the whole thing and you know some mystics have the view that you got to go dissolve in the unknown mover some some people view that it, when you realize you're the unknown mover it has it makes no difference what uh, whichever uh, it's like once you see some once you have experienced horse riding then you, the person knows what horse riding is you know once the person finds some sort of trust that moves beyond their sensory uh, analysis. Trust is the key to all doors, really. Because you got to trust the key and trust putting it, uh, turning it in the lock and trust opening the door, all those require trust to something. You know, guys, <clears throat> um, to really bring it back to teleportation somehow, you know, <laughs> it's, 
Um, let me see. I mean, definitely, I, when emotions have passed, I've been emotional. I, I've experienced multiple senses of self, not as if like m me being multiple senses of self. That means it's as if like, um, imagine, I'll give you an example. Imagine you gave a promise to someone and you suddenly break that promise. There is suddenly like in that instant a remembrance of the moment you made that promise to the person and how now that you broke it and the person suddenly gets upset, you know. So I would say if you break a promise, it's like an emotional uh, disconnect with yourself, you know. Even an angry person, I am telling you, sometimes when you look at an angry person, their emotion doesn't match the moment. If you look in an like uh, anger, it it has energy from another world in it. When a person gets angry, and it's not that it's energy from another world. I feel it's like a, a sort of possession from the past. What does that mean? That means I don't know. The the child was pushed when it was young. The the person was pushed when they were young, and uh, they never got to push back. And years later, you know, when somebody accidentally uh, you know t tap their shoulders to them they suddenly push back as if like now was their chance to push back you know it's like these dormant emotions of unsatisfied uh uh projected efforts in life In my inner realms, I would say when I at least think of my science fiction, <clears throat> because it appears to me as a film, it's like I'm watching a film I'm in. Uh, it, when I say I perceive something in the inner realms, it's like that. It's like pretty much like the mind is always dreaming, but in the conscious waking state, we're so focused on it being in a certain modality that we don't notice the mind is like an additional pro like a uh, like a program always running you know that means literally it's like the computer is never shut down but it's just put on sleep mode i would say our intelligence uh, in, in dynamic states is just the creative force Everybody is some sort of sculpture of the forces of nature.
emotional teleportation when I'm thinking about it right now it can it can just only mean that the emotions are all accessible in one place so let us think that the mind is space the body is matter anything that matter does is in space even if matter wonders about its source it has to deal with space so let us say we find the truths to the observable universe what then about the unobservable universe sometimes i feel this world is designed like a theme park what that means is it feels like it's designed to endlessly run, you know? Imagine a theme park that never closed. And the person, imagine, it can't get out of this theme park. And the person feels like this theme park is not my home, <clears throat> you know? So that feeling is, I have, as a being in, in, in this plane of existence, I have felt that emotion often, that I feel a stranger to my own eyes. Not, not in, in regards to some sort of uh, ideological analysis but there's certain moments it's just like temperature you know how certain moments are cold certain moments are hot certain moments the person feels completely th it's, it's it's known you know stuff is known and certain moments it's completely unknown We can even say <clears throat> emotions perhaps may never be con con comprehensible emotions may never be comprehensible to I mean I'm thinking to the individual object that is thinking of itself as an I thought and that I thought being a tip of the iceberg and the person wondering what is my emotions of the moment so if all your emotions of the whole moment is the tip of the iceberg that means all emotions you have perceived is is not the whole picture so that means emotions are just like language a mystery so I, I've created this term the language threshold now we can say there's a school of thought that sees language uh, 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 actually thought being required first then emotions you know because there needs to be something to have an emotion that's something in the inner realms is a thought is a subject that means a thought can't think which technically means if the person treats the moment as a thought, they can't treat one part of the moment as a thought. They, there is no such thing even as the concept of a thinker. There is just thought. Or I would say a sort of changeless qualia. Qualia is the term for an inner event. An inner psychological event, an experiential event.
you know, it's like wondering about the question, how does a person feel about infinity? How does a person feel about an endless sky that can't be measured? Imagine there is a emperor, a king back in the day. This is just playfully I'm sharing this story. See it as more like a thought experiment, this specific story. But uh, imagine a king. The king's daughter cries, you know, to the most powerful emperor of the land. You know, and the king's daughter says, I want to know how, how long the sky is. I want to know how long the sky is. Measure the sky for me, father, you know. And, <laughs> and let us say this emperor is like, my daughter wants to measure the sky. Suddenly this, this emperor commands all the scientists, all the minds, all the minds to come up with a measurement and to, in some sense, demonstrate to the king the measurement of the sky. And so many people come and tell the king, you know, it can't be measured. Pretty much that's the story. <laughs> the sky can't be measured regardless of how much we want it to be a, be, be a certain length. <clears throat> and that's the wisdom of life. It's not like you can't, it doesn't have cheat codes. Maybe in the outer realms there is cheat codes, for example, like, you know, uh, certain people who get ahead in the workplace in certain ways, you know, like, but I would say like, <clears throat> maybe there, instead of cheat codes, it's just something that has to uh, be journeyed through. It's like we're on an existential road trip. Or on the road of existence, we're driving our vehicle of experience. What can be said? Thoughts come and go, emotions come and go, the cells in our body come and go, and the only thing that somehow remains and maintains the <clears throat> individuality is the memory and the attention that's active through it. That means when I think about the meaning of my life, I have to consider the past. When I have to consider the past, the past is the past. It's all memories. So literally when a person looks at, uh, reads a book, their memories, the book is sequencing their memories to themselves. And empathy is emotional teleportation 
or it's a sort of emotional access to the same thing. So technically, you could say, um, <clears throat> I don't know, if, if like a comedian tells a joke and four people laugh at the same time, they were all, all four people were emotionally teleported to a single mo uh, moment, you know, or a certain way the comedian said the joke, the stand-up comedian. So you could say there's a type of teleport, uh, um, conscious, I don't know, I don't know how to say it. I feel we are way more free behind our eyes than in front of it. This is why when we when something doesn't go in accordance to uh, when there is no when the freedom from the outer realms is taken, the inner realms really notices it. You can say freedom can be momentary as well, you know. A person is talking on the phone, they have freedom, their phone battery dies, the freedom's taken away. But with the responsibility to understand freedom, as Yeon Mi Park says, as she says, If the freedom is based on circumstances, variables of design, the condition of that moment of the world, you can say a person pushing a door and the door not opening is enslavement, a person pulling the door <clears throat> And realizing that whole time, if they had pulled it, they could have been free instantly, but they were just pushing. They were just trying in one modality. This is something where I've recently felt more I need to <clears throat> uh, practice, you know. I've been giving these talks for a year, uh, for some time now, and I, it's been constantly occurring to me that... Uh, I don't know, it's kind of like changing elevations of value because everything the person really does before they do it, there's a value system. If they're consciously behaving, I'm not saying like savageness, I'm saying if the person is consciously behaving, they're also in extracting a sort of uh, boundary to the context of the moment.
by the way, guys, um, <clears throat> I don't know if people do this. I think a, a, a percentage of the audience may be doing this. But um, <clears throat> people can just open a tab and play any song they like behind the, uh, the, t the live stream. That's the song I'm listening to right now, whoever wants to listen to. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna play it here. Let's do this. The purpose <clears throat> of the breath is to create an opportunity for the name to project the world it can move in. The body <clears throat> is a follower of the guru, which is the earth. The body follows the instructions of the guy in mind. In other words, biological existence is <clears throat> nature's reinforcements to your attributeless field of being. A smile will find the face of the faceless. Only when language has been put back as if Excalibur was never pulled. Silence, stillness, <clears throat> mirrors of the moment before time and space could speak. An unknown viewer of a world that can be known endlessly. Measure the skies, <clears throat> an historic lie. to accept the dream is the final awakening. <clears throat> it's wondering about perfection before the concept existed.
Okay, guys, I'm gonna. I feel like reading this poem I wrote in、uh, 2016 from this poetry book called Endless Roads. The poem is called Advanced Monkeys. When advanced monkeys write, <clears throat> does the river of God smile at every drop carried? Yes, 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 and yes to the no. Behind our eyes, heaven has always spoken to earth. Whoever you are, you must care for the life that has come to be you. Do you see the great gathering kept by invisible strings of all the elements that have become you? The personality of God is an omniscient truth. No man needs to be denied. A woman of truth. Love speaks louder than commands. Beyond control, always kiss her hand. The next poem is called Philo. Oh my God, I can't pronounce it. <laughs> Philosophizing sheep. Once a sheep, guys. This poem is one of the best things I've ever written. <clears throat> Once a sheep began speaking about philosophy with the shepherd. The first question was, "Are you sleeping?" The shepherd responded, "No, or instead of me, you'd be talking to a wolf." The second question was, "Who is counting?" The shepherd responded, "The self of selves that is the I thought we call God's focus." After that, the sheep had no questions that the answer could come from without. The next poem is called "Time Does Tell." Time does tell many things, like a story being listened to by non-existence. We feel we know, but how could broken bones create a new tower of sacred vision? When can love no longer be possibly a cruel mistress? When confusion walks into confusion, clarity seems to be a new window of opportunity. I have become. A yogi of divine love. I once saw. I once saw my girlfriend and only saw God. <laughs> of course, the beauty beyond words should not be masked through poetic prose. What has annihilated the ring from my finger? As love demands a supreme glow behind the lies of a crooked door. When lovers bloom from within, all relationships belong to the heart and soul. How do the tri- triumphant hold their own trumpets? If you seek meditation, you must first realize you are unborn. And that's how the poem ends. Guys, this next poem is,、um, I think, pretty animated too.、Um, the mother bear. That's the name of the poem. <laughs> the blessing of the divine is a focus that normality can only appreciate when insanity is caressed. I thought love was something to have, but I have come to realize it must be held. Who is so brave to kiss a bear on the forehead on the forehead while in hibernation? Of course, the、uh, of course the beauty of God works like this: the mother bear could never be scared of her own creation. The next poem is titled "A Tourist That Didn't Like Traveling." <laughs> As the airplane landed and the sleeping child opened his or her eyes, how could reality be here? 
Could the plane of existence be set beyond location? A tourist in an unknown land is on vacation not to be too caught in plants. How does the journeyer solo it out in the road that destiny has paved? <laughs> Guys, just keep in mind the next thing I'm going to read. <laughs> I wrote this in uh, 2016, just remember that. <laughs> so, uh, a tourist in an unknown land is on, a vaca is on vacation not to, be too, not, not to be too caught in plants. How does the journey... <laughs> How does the journeyer solo it out in the road destiny is paved? Who would have a threesome with Dorothy and Al <laughs> Dorothy and Alice? You know, from uh, the I don't know what I was thinking here. As mystery takes the GPS on a ride, when you when your new feet touch a new land, know the candle has been lit. <laughs> the joy of living is to be in the moment. The next poem is The Light in the Room. Shining stars cannot lie to the wolf that has learned to howl at the moon alone. What makes a man an independent unit of mankind? How does lightning strike itself in an instant of wrong? All choices have their own paths too. Even the number one cannot deny the work of number two. When duality and unity dance, how do the lost find the found? The mastery of the navigation between formless and formed worlds is that the lover has given herself to the love of her choice. How vicious can a snake's cage be without the snake? A picture of a cake will never satisfy an empty stomach. In reality, we must seek the wisdom of being before the doer forgets the faith of an existential cosmos. Love the kind in the kindest way until you notice the self spacelessly. The light in the room does not judge the shadows. Emanation has only one path. The source of existence was yours and is yours at last. And the last poem for tonight, The Rice Field. A lady for 80 years bent down every day to pick up rice. At the end of her life, she had one message to her daughter. Before you eat, remember my breath in every grain of rice. In the subtitle, guys, before I end off, first the idea came emotions beyond, then the idea came emotions beyond tetra. And I don't know why these three words I felt putting them beside one another, but emotions beyond tetra, the tetra is an implication to the four elements, earth, air, fire, water. Now, some in certain contexts, there is the fifth element, ether, but that element, that fifth element is seen as consciousness, as if that fifth element is in between all the elements connecting them. 
that means technically between two people, you know, the space isn't empty. What's in the space? Space. <laughs> you know, there's, it's like the space between people is, is, is something, you know, to, is something to the, as a concept, you know, that means if space was truly nothing, why do we, how could we have a word for nothing? Again, the dissonance between the linguistic uh, implied reality, indirect reality, and the direct experiential reality. And emotions are complex in the sense that I would say not all emotions are yours. This is a statement I will say. I don't think it's being said that much, but not all emotions are the person. That means sometimes when a person is feeling emotional, they have to ask, is this emotion from them or is that just the emotional weather of the day? That means I've had nights, this was, of course, a long time ago, but like I, I had certain nights of like stress, like these loops of stress. Imagine how I think about like how I break up certain ideas in these talks. Now I think as if I'm trying to, in a, in a stressed uh, uh, state of mind, trying to break myself with the same intensity. And I would wake up the next day totally not caring about that. You know, that's the unique thing. It's transitory, a lot of emotions. I think the emotions that linger more, they are more like signals, signals the person has to notice. And when a person sees another human being suffering, because they can see themselves there, because they can see how that can happen to them, that's, that's the meme being emotionally uh, teleported. That means it's like the person sees someone and, and uh, needs someone needs help getting up, do you know, and remembers a time where they had fallen and nobody had helped them. You know, imagine they ask this person, have you seen a miracle? And the person's like, yeah, every day. And the person's like, what do you mean? You see a miracle every day? Like, are you serious? And the person's like, yeah, yeah. And the person's like, do you see a miracle every day, 24 seven? He's like, no. And the person's like, what do you mean? Do you see a miracle like certain times throughout the day or something? And he's like, yeah. 
And the person's like, what kind of miracle do you see? Do you know? And the person says, every time I look in the mirror, it's a miracle how there is something here at all. How there is a form. You see, this, this universal sector is really empty. The emptiness we fathom is not the true emptiness. Just like how what we how we look at the just like how our view when we open our eyes, we don't see all of the earth, we just see a range. Do you know? And the way we comprehend emptiness is like the range of fulfillment, it's like the absence of it is the emptiness. So it's as if life is made to be a changing system because there is teachings of emptiness required and teachings of fullness. Let's say right now, there was a, maybe see it as an app for teleporting, not just thoughts, but uh, vi visuals and images, but, uh, but like an app that teleports emotions. <clears throat> so imagine a stadium of people looking at like athletes on a field. Now there is an app that that app allows you to experience the emotion of your favorite player on the soccer pitch. And imagine suddenly you see every person on the every person on the stadium stand being able to experience what the what do you call it? Um what the uh, person on the <clears throat> the athlete on the field experiences. Do you know imagine a GoPro camera but um, which somebody else is seeing through, but instead of a GoPro camera, it's an emotional camera. So that means a person could suddenly feel, imagine in this app, you opened your phone and you're like, okay, let me see how people feel in like this country. And you pressed it and you suddenly got like, uh, an, uh, an emotion. <laughs> you're like, no way people are feeling happy, you know, somewhere. <laughs> But what I'm trying to say is like a sort of um, instantaneity of emotional transmission. And that's the thing, really. When you look at, like, everybody focus, uh, centralizes uh, intelligence on uh, at the central focus of it as love, right? But when we go look at all the literature that's been written, you know, between lovers in history, Romeo and Juliet, trust me, they were like that archetype of Romeo and Juliet is everywhere. <laughs> so it's as if when you, when you see that kind of literature with a sort of hopeless romanticism at the end, it's like an emotional performance. I would say poetry is an emotional performance in language. And what the, the, a true emotion is, if the emotion is real, the person can't act. You know, there was a scene in Game of Thrones. I wish the writers had done this, but uh, at the same time, it wouldn't fit the context, maybe. But there was a scene like where that lady in the red dress looks at Jon Snow. <laughs> you know, she looks at Jon Snow and says, you know nothing, Jon Snow, in Game of Thrones. And I was like, oh my God, what if Jon Snow turned back and was like, it's like, you don't know, you know nothing, lady. <laughs> Jon Snow's like, you know nothing too. <laughs> It's like, you know, it's, <laughs> it's like nobody knows anything. It's too big to know.
And you know, a great question is <clears throat> that does the person own an emotion? Like, you know how we, we choose a name? How a person like, is given a name, pretty much? Not that we choose a name, we're given a name. So I'm, some, I'm thinking like, or may, let's say the person has a choice for their name. Let's say we choose our names, okay? <laughs> let's say we can, because we can, technically we can see we could have. Yeah. <laughs> can you imagine your future self time traveling from the future, stopping your parents from naming you? It's like, no, name this child. <laughs> I think this should be a saying, but the body thinks short term, the mind thinks long term. So let, I was getting to this point that if the person can have a name, a static name, a person can technically have a static emotion because if the emotion arises from thoughts, that school of thought, it makes sense. If the emotion is separate from thought, the emotion requires some selfhood, some content. That content is thought. <clears throat> so either thoughts are in emotions or emotions are in thoughts. Who knows? It's like, am I feeling my thoughts or are my thoughts feelings? I can't tell. <laughs> it's like, am I thinking my emotions or am I feeling my thoughts? That's another way of saying it. Emotions are to this nature that I would say people can test this, test this for themselves, where if you're emotional, imagine some, there's an emotional spike or some emotional uprising in the inner realms of the person, right? I would tell you when there is inner realm movement, when the person is emotional, the body is better sometimes to be still. Or if the person has been still for a while and they're, then they're, they become emotional, maybe it's better to move. But I'm saying the whole point is, if there is an activity, this harmonious activity going on behind your eyes, it makes sense to uh, simplify the movements of the body, go lie down on a bed or just sit down somewhere, be simple for a moment, you know, and pay attention to what the mind is doing. You know, this is, the, this is the power of the unknown, that it can allow a person <clears throat> to sit down in a moment and watch what happens. That is the power of the unknown. I, I can't, I, I will tell you, beyond unknown witnessing, all powers are uh, kingdoms of melting snowmen. There is one true power in this realm, and it is to see the real earth. Not middle earth, the real earth. <laughs> I always I thought about that scene in Lord of the Rings where Gandalf that epic scene where Gandalf says you shall not pass and breaks like the uh, I don't know staircase bridge or whatever <laughs> um, and the Balrog that creature of shadow and flame falls with Gandalf I was thinking like nobody thought in that moment what the Balrog was thinking what that creature was thinking like, technically, Gandalf went into the home of this creature, you know? Like, <laughs> you know, 
and shouted, you shall not pass, broke this creature's, part of this creature's home, you know, and at the end killed the creature. Pretty much Gandalf invaded the Balrog's space. <laughs> oh, man. But guys, I mean, see, emotions move us in different ways. Can you imagine, you know, if I had come and I'm like, guys, today's lecture is going to be about emotions. And then I just had started crying for an hour. <laughs> People would be like, what an emotional sermon, you know. The Buddha has this story, the silent sermon, where he's just holding a flower in his hand and all his disciples are sitting and Buddha's looking at that flower and smiling. And all the disciples are sitting there quietly and they're all super strict, trying to be super, you know, robotically perfect. <clears throat> and there's this old man who's walking by, not part of the disciples, and he just sees... He just sees Buddha with the flower in his hand and staring at it and everybody's staring at the flower in Buddha's hand. And this old man smiles. And then legend is born out of this moment that this was the only person that heard Buddha's silent sermon. That it wasn't something to hear with ears as sounds, as concepts. It was an emotional resonance. So I would say, as we, the concept of teleportation means instantaneity. What that means is if two beings can have the same exact emotion, technically the emotion surpasses individualism. But if each being had its own emotion, and their emotions couldn't be teleported or, or even, I don't know, you know how in quantum physics, like the electrons in two locations simultaneously on a very microcosmic level? It's a simultaneity. And I feel when a person speaks, literally like, air, like, like the airbender, you know, or like those mages who would control the elements, A poet is literally bending the elements of the inner realms. I'm evoking it. Do you know that means that's the cool thing about the nature of the mind. Once you can visualize something, it doesn't matter if your eyes are open or closed. That means if 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 like I'll I'll say this as an example. If the person just closes their eyes and visualizes like a square, you know? And after a while, they would be able to visualize a square whether their eyes are closed or not. I feel empathy is emotional teleportation. It is also self-dissolution. So you could say it's a mixture of future rationalism plus past Future rationalism, uh, the plus the person's history, plus I don't know, I don't know how what else to add to this to make this equal to empathy. I don't know if a person, when a person empathizes with someone, are they becoming like them? 
or are they seeing a pattern that is actually in them before they see that person? It could be overwhelming. Imagine you could feel the emotions of a neighborhood. Imagine there was this kind of like, let's say before we developed cyberspace, it was like, or maybe you can say cyberspace is a suggestion of people being able to have the same emotion. Pretty much when you see a bunch of uh, like people in a cinema, look at the, look at the screen become emotional or they all respond in a certain way or it's a horror movie they all get scared what it means is actually the mind doesn't have doesn't have any content the content is the, the attention focuses on the content what does that mean that means a person if a person see something and they're sad in one moment then the next couple scenes in the movie they're suddenly laughing that technically means the emotion was based on the changing thing and being witnessed in the moment so emotions are how attention ch changes from thought to thought before that specific thought has completed its design, that specific archetype. So I would say we can, I don't know, now, I guess now I would say emotions are the broken bridges between thoughts. Or bridges rebuilt, you know. I would say there are emotions that are honorable. There are emotions that are, I don't know, dishonorable. There's environments. A person can go into an environment and the environment could give them an emotion. There's been certain times where I've, I've, I've walked in just certain paths and I've wanted to go a certain way and just I've had this feeling not to go that way. And I've taken a different detour. So there is, there is something about the significance of emotion being a signal enough for the attitude to change. I mean, I could say when I look at the word emotion, it gives me the idea of what if it's like electromagnetic motion? We are, we do, every person has an electromagnetic field. And what if it's a change in this electromagnetic field? Now, if this electromagnetic field can be changed from the unobservable universe, Guys, I'm just going to declare this. I would say this is like, people can treat this as Mr. Within's uh, <laughs> tip of the iceberg theory. <laughs> <coughs> tip of the iceberg denial theory. Let's call it that. That means anything, everything we see that we are trying to base our knowledge on is just the tip of the iceberg. Just like our tree's roots are not visible, but they are there, how many ways of advanced 
uh, being are there on this planet that we don't know yet? You know, says, can the emotions then color in the details, connoting sense, taste, touch, etc., leading to more memory from sensory perceptive emotions of the bridges of broken thoughts? <clears throat> I wouldn't say it's the bridges of broken thoughts. The bridge is not the two land masses it's connecting. Emotion, the bridge, maybe it's a thought in, in a different angle. <laughs> oh my God, what if we have this view that emotions are thoughts in higher dimensions? In probable potential higher dimensions. I personally feel there's an incredible geometry at work that is the source of the interconnectivity of the realm. When I consider oneness, it is true that there is a sort of, like my inner child is a Bhakti Yogi, but I would say <laughs> who my eyes, of eyes find themselves now is organized geometrical projective movement. I would say that personality or, th or thoughts are pixels for an attributeless viewer. You know, I would say the, the, the approach I have at least is that you look at how much uh, you honestly have access to the moment and then what you don't have access to, you attempt. If the attempt goes forth, the person goes. If the attempt doesn't, the person can't push the unknown. That means wondering about the unknown and trying to contain it in the past known is impossible. That means the past is always ridiculous to the new. And the past is no choice but to declare the new rid ridiculous. <laughs> unless this war of time ends people are freed from uh, enforced uh, ideological self-imposed ide ideological containment I'm telling you we should treat our uh, ego or I, uh, I thought identity as um, as a changing world. We are changing with the world. You know, a person can uh, think can think they're immortal, but the body has its own plans, you know. And here's, here's an even more interesting idea, guys. <clears throat> Let's say we were, like, in this picture right now. We were there in that forest looking at those stars. 
even though I think there's a divine Photoshop involved in this natural picture. <laughs> When we look at nature, we're instantly teleported to the phenomena. When a lion roars, all animals attain an emotion of fear. That means, let's say a lion roars in the jungle, and I don't know, there's a squirrel and a rabbit. Both the squirrel and the rabbit freak out. But in some sense... That means both the squirrel and rabbit are teleported to a moment of fear. Imagine we start having this lingo where the person's like, I just emotionally teleported to, to um, I don't know, the suffering of my childhood for a second. Or the person's like, imagine that instead of saying, telling the person, what are you thinking about? Imagine we say, what's going on in your inner realms? And the person says, I teleported to, I uh, emotionally teleported, or uh, I was just uh, scrolling over uh, a couple memories. Do you see what I mean? There's so many ways we can speak about it, but we have just been lost in the word thought. Do you know what I mean? That means thought is like a, a uniform where every person who's been born uh, after a certain point, you know, after the misinterpretation of the I think, therefore I am statement. Thought is like the same uniform. It's like, it's like uh, a, a, a military uniform for a multidimensional being. <laughs> I would say there is unknown emotions as well. Emotions where we may experience, but no, there's no concept. Nobody has given words to that sort of reception of experience. Technically, because everybody is a unique DNA, everybody can add to language, contribute to language. And the speed of your attention is up to you. This is so crucial to realize you are the pre your attention is literally being as awareness the whole moment. Your mind, think just like look around where you are. Your mind is like a candle flame, uh, illuminating the content, the physical content of the room. That means mind is light when it comes to what a world means. The mind is light, enlightening the world. The Just like how light enter our eyes, the mind enters, the attention enters phenomena. So it's, it's very poetic. Um, the light of the world enters the eyes of man and the mind of man enters the eyes of the world. And the light, the mind... Okay, let's create a world. Uh, let's create a word here. Mind light. Like the light of the... <laughs> you know, mind... <laughs> Again, imagine it's like, what do you want for Christmas? I want a mind light. <laughs> oh, man. It's just a massive exploration. If the conscious human being cares to contribute to it, there would be uh, just efficiency. That means pretty much we're like bees and we have to endlessly... Uh, a, uh, skillfully uh, just live e efficiently in every moment. That means, I'll tell you, this is something I'll, I mean, I'll say it like this, like, sometimes if I have to think about something uh, or let's say consider 
the, the geometry or the design of an idea in my inner realms. Uh, if it's a very heavy idea, I have to shift the self into a story. That means if the person wants to remember something, let's say that has 12 levels to it, then uh, let's say you want to juggle 12 contexts or something like that. <clears throat> um, how can I say this? Just like how the wheel of fortune uh, thing had different colors on it and it would move, the attention is literally that thing that all the, all the wheels would pass. Uh, so in some sense, it's not like the person is the emotion. Uh, <sighs> Guys, there is something like hundred percent Khalil Gibran must have something on emotions. Just hang on, guys. I remember something here. I think this is the cherry on the cake of this episode. <laughs> Literally, there's a website, 17 Khalil Gibran quotes for insight into your emotions. <laughs> How convenient. <clears throat> okay, guys, let's uh, quick quote tunnel from Khalil Gibran, this incredible Lebanese mystic and poet. Khalil Gibran says the most massive characters are seared with scars. Khalil Gibran says forgetting is a form of freedom. Khalil Gibran says, to be little, you have to be little. Khalil Gibran says, love knows not its own depth until the hour of separation. Khalil Gibran says, if need, if, if indeed you must be candid, be candid beautifully. Khalil Gibran says, perplexity is the beginning of knowledge. Khalil Gibran says, how generous you are, earth, and how strong is your yearning for your children. Khalil Gibran says, for what is evil but good tortured by its own hunger and thirst. Wow, 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 wow. Wow. I want to say so many wows that... It's just like, wow. What it means is imagine everybody starts off from a neutral state of mind. And because it's simpler to be good, let's say if the person is in a good environment, that for a young child growing up, he can accept the, the good easily. So it's like everybody is neutral, then good, then when that good is not enough, the desire could have chaotic effect. Khalil Gibran says, sadness is but a wall between two gardens. What an incredible quote. Khalil Gibran says, much of your pain is self-chosen. Yeah, just like clothing that the person wears. I'm telling you, the mind... Uh, uh, the mind wears language. Your beliefs are like a coat for your mind. <laughs> Khalil Gibran says, work is love made visible. Khalil Gibran says, doubt is a pain too lonely to know that faith is his twin brother.
Khalil Gibran says generosity is giving more than you can and pride is taking less than you need. Khalil Gibran says to understand the heart and mind of a person look not at what he has already achieved but at what he aspires to. Yeah. Because if, if the past is glorified, the opportunity for the new is being wasted. Not that it's being wasted. I mean, sometimes the reference point is needed, but I would say... The future suggests how much the person actually achieved what the person intends for the future that means if if the person doesn't doesn't uh have a feeling of wanting to create something here while they're alive you can say it's as if they have no sense of achievement it's as if it's like they haven't uh noticed why we have hands You know, it's like it's like you look at a cup. And what's the purpose of the, the meaning of life for this cup? And you know, and you're like, okay, to fill it up with water. You look at the human design, and it's to live in the world, and in, especially with the faculty of just like our attention, concentration, uh, reflexes, finger movements. You know, we can. It's like it's meant to be used. It's like it's like it's like why why is the person being a biological being? <laughs> to participate in the biological event you know it's like the meaning of existence is so instant but it's experience that wants something out of uh the existence that changes you know i guess the view on it killer gibran says for life and death are one even as the river and the sea are one Khalil Gibran says, all our words are but crumbs that fall, fall down from the feast of the mind. <clears throat> I could see him saying this to like a king or something, even though there were no kings at his time. But, uh, Khalil, Khalil Gibran says, the eye of a human being is a microscope, which makes the world seem bigger than it really is. And that's it, guys. This may be a unique statement, but I think the fountain of youth, its location is in wonder. Mystery and awe, I would say that is the unknown, is the fountain of youth. Wonder, specifically. That word encapsulates it better. Wonder is the fountain of youth. Whoever finds wonder, you'll you'll stick around here. <laughs> you know, there's the world is not just an object or a subject. It is the maxed out potential of both to see what can be. So, anyways, guys, thanks for listening. I hope this episode was helpful. Namaste. And the answer to the title is yes. <laughs>